Hey, Howard Jacobson here. Welcome to today's Plant Yourself podcast. A quick reminder, this podcast is free for everyone and supported by patrons. So if you would like to find out about becoming a patron of the show and helping us out, helping defray the cost, helping to spread the message, you can do so at plantyourself.com slash gift. Thanks so much and enjoy today's episode. Hey, welcome to Plant Yourself. I'm your host, Howard Jacobson. And today I'm going to share with you what I think is probably the most important conversation I have ever had on this podcast. And it's with two returning guests whom you might know, uh, Dustin and Josh Lajani. Josh, you will certainly know if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time. He's my business partner, my writing partner. We've written two books together. We've done online courses. We've led retreats. We've spoken publicly. Um, his brother, Dustin, is on a similar track. They both have amazing transformation stories. You know, they went from morbidly obese to fit, from junk food addicts to plant based eaters, from hunters to vegans, from sedentary to active. And, you know, everyone in the plant based and vegan communities celebrates them for these achievements. But to me, what's most inspiring and exciting about their new identities has nothing to do with food or health. Although I think that changing their food and their health paved the way for these other transformations. Instead, it's about how going plant based started this domino chain of changes that opened them up to full on compassion, to undefended, non discriminatory, unconditional love for other beings. And, and first, it was for themselves, you know, and, and then next for the animals and then for all life on the planet. They went from being homophobic to celebrating pride with rainbow posts, from politically reactionary to progressive, and from racist to anti-racist. Now, I've already gotten some flack for publishing this conversation. It's been up on YouTube quietly with no um, announcement about it, but some people found it. Um, and I fully expect my Patreon funding to decrease. And, you know, lest you think I'm being brave here, my risk is nothing compared to that of Dustin and Josh, who not only live in the plant based world, but also still in the small bayou town in southeast Louisiana, where they were born, a community that is struggling to rise to the challenge of the present moment, where so many white Americans have begun to say this stops now. And what this is, of course, is racism, where we see it in police brutality, we see it in unequal economic outcomes. And we we see it and hear it in the stories, experiences and Facebook posts of our friends of color who are saying, you guys have not seen this up to now. We've been trying to tell you. And it's time that you listen and that you hear us. So the main gist of the flack is why can't plant based people just stick to that topic without go all going all gooey about social justice and turning people off. And I want you to be the judge. Does this conversation highlighting the Lajani brothers transformation turn people off to going plant based? Or is it perhaps the most eloquent and beautiful argument you've ever heard in support of eating with compassion? And I want to say one other thing to my white audience in particular, and it's that I'm a little uncomfortable sharing this conversation at this moment precisely because so many people like me, white liberals and progressives, can look at those old racist Lajanis and say to themselves, well, that was terrible and good for them for changing, but I've never been a racist like that, or I've never been a racist. And if that's your reaction, and I certainly share it because it makes me feel good about myself, then I invite you to listen to this conversation to, through a different lens. I want you to ask yourself, where do I need to start showing the courage that Dustin and Josh demonstrate right now? Where are my own core beliefs unsupported by my actions on a daily basis? Where are my current blind spots about how I'm contributing without intention or consciousness to the perpetuation of racist outcomes in my society? Because we're not sharing this conversation in order to be congratulated. Instead, we're having it to model discomfort. The same discomfort we feel as plant-based eaters or vegans when we stand up for our way of eating in the face of peer pressure and even social ridicule. The same discomfort we experience when we exercise to the point of exhaustion. 
You know, being healthy in this society, being plant-based, being vegan, these are all gyms where we've been honing our discomfort muscles. So now it's time to get out of the gym and start lifting weights to make this planet great for everyone. So without further ado, Dustin and Josh Lajani, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. What's up? What's up? For those of you who, who, who are only on audio, you should check this out. It'll be on YouTube. Um, we got the, the Lajani brothers in the, in the front seat of a, what is it, a Ford truck? Yeah, my, my Ford uh, F-150, 4 by 4 of course. <laughs> All right, cool. So I'm, I'm going to see if I, can, uh, if I can work the video so that I can put myself in the middle, like in the middle seat. All right. um, yeah. So we have, we've had this conversation many times uh, about you guys, your journey from the way you were eating and living regarding your health to where you are now. So I think, like, I'll, I'll say up front, we're going to talk about other things. But let, why don't we just start there to kind of uh, set the scene. So if you guys are just going to want to describe, you know, the, the thing that podcast hosts always ask you, like, tell us your story, like, if we could do that in like five minutes. Yeah, sure. Like, I'll go first. Uh, just I, um, I'm a normal country Louisiana guy born and raised in South Louisiana from a small rural community called called Chag Bay. Um, me and Dustin both are from there. And, you know, by the time I would say 30 years old, I had gotten up to 400 pounds. You know, things that contributed to that was my love of food that my grandfather instilled in me, my love of football and identifying as a big man. And all of those things, not to mention the, the, the calories that I took on, uh, really um, helped me become a 400 plus pound man by the time I was 30 years old. Fell in love with, with running, trying to lose weight in 2011. And uh, that brought me to a plant based diet. And it really changed my life. And not, I was compelled not only to be healthier myself, but I was learning these really amazing details and things I had never heard of before, these facts that I had never heard before about a plant-based diet. So it was only natural to try and tell the people that you absolutely love the most about it in a way that's compelling. And luckily for me, my brother is is right here beside me, um, and he's going to tell you a very similar story because it, it has become a, 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 a contagious thing in my family, being healthy. Cool. Yeah, basically the same the same upbringing, uh, just, you know, falling falling right in line with what we seem go on around us and uh, trying to find our place to fit in, especially as a big guy. Uh, always wanted to lose weight, but on the weekends when we were eating and drinking, it really didn't matter at that point. <laughs> uh, sometimes I would find ways to lose weight, but always end right back up. Um, where I started because every time I tried to do it, it was just so I could participate back in that same realm, but just in more comfortability in my own skin because I would have been, you know, smaller. But it just always ballooned me right back to where I started. So um, just the plant-based thing was a lot different approach. So Josh had a lot of success with it, made a lot of sense. Could I'm, I like logic. Um, once I watched Forks Over Knives and um, fat, sick, and nearly dead, and and some other things, and it just it made a lot of sense, and I saw Josh doing it, and uh, uh, here we are going on that journey. Is it was just the beginning of a lot of different changes, <laughs> put it that way. Right. So when we've talked, and I've I've had both of you on the podcast separately. This is your first joint appearance. Um, we've I've I've sort of alluded to like it wasn't just you changed your plants, but everything else stayed the same, right? Like plants are running, but we're the same. Like there were other changes around sort of compassion, like you changed your views on animals and animal agriculture. Um, and we've but we've never really dove into that. I think partly I was reticent because I'm aware that my podcast has a broad listener base and there's people I don't want to offend people. Right. And honestly, fuck that. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I have I have been humbled and and felt like I my efforts are wanting by the Black Lives Matter movement that I was not, yeah. I have not been doing my part. So I'm 
I'm, I'm happy just to to try to make up for that now. And I wanted to have you guys on because like you've changed a great deal in terms of your views on lots of political, social, economic and justice issues yeah, as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so maybe the, like when you guys give talks, one like the, the, the favorite thing is showing your fat pictures. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you post, a, you know, or you go on Facebook and you post the picture of like the three of you at Cassie's wedding, like being huge. And then the picture of all of you, like in your running gear and everyone's like, oh, my God. And I'm going to ask you to do something, I think, way harder than that, which is to paint the before picture of, you know, of your views on race. And it's a scary thing to admit, honestly, with a bunch of a bunch of um, black friends that I really, I really um, <laughs> respect and admire. And so, but there's a real history there of how we were taught about racism, um, the way we behaved in it, uh, the way we perpetuated it. Um, you know, I don't, if there's a story when I was in high school. I was in a fight my senior year with a friend of mine and it was totally a racially motivated fight. And we, I, I wasn't allowed back on campus, um, for the rest of my senior year that year, I went to a, like a, a school that was run by police because of that fight, because we weren't allowed back on campus because I and my friend would cause too much racial tension. Mm -hmm. And your friend was black. No, my friend was white. Okay, so what was the... we got in a fight with other black with a, with black guys? Okay, and uh, and we and it was an issue. It was an issue, and so the reason that I'm telling that story is is to just show like where I was back then that the you know it was us against the n words is what it was, you know, and that's that's a that's something that. Um, that's a life that I lived. I was, I was, I was honestly emboldened by the behavior of my grandfather, who I love. You know, he's like in this weird place in my life where I don't want to indict him, and I don't want my my black friends to hate him because he was really a good man. But at the same time, he taught us a lot of things that we are having to unlearn. Not, we don't have to. We choose to. We choosing to, you know. And um, so that's like the before picture to me is that that person in in high school who went with the flow and believed the things and said the words and did the deeds that kept me in that place of comfort, that kept me in that white herd, that kept me in that safe place, you know. Mm. And then that's where. The difference is for me, like that's not only on my own in high school did we behave that way, did I behave that way. We there was uh, we could go on and on and on about individual. Let's not even start on microaggressions. You know, I'm mm -hmm. talking about real ones, regular ones, uh -huh. macroaggressions. You know, and and at the same time, it's what I was taught. My grandfather. Is, it, Dustin can attest to this. He was a regular user of the word and he uh, of the N word, and it was open, and he was defiant about it. And he was from North Mississippi, and we were made very comfortable with that sort of rhetoric around race. Like that's how we talked about it, and it was they were lazy and. You know, my grandfather worked a crew and it was he worked a lot of he hired a lot of black guys. And it always confused me because they worked really hard for him. He belittled them a lot oftentimes on the, for the smallest things, yet respected them in the afternoon. And we he would tell them stories and we'd stay in the same house and we'd. He would get drunk in his, cook, in a, cook yeah, supper for him. he would cook That's supper and it was like this weird, I never got, cause he, on one hand he respected him and on the other hand he didn't. And, um, that's just the world that, that's the world I grew up in. But that's kind of what you did where we grew up is, you know, the way you acted a lot of times around people aren't 
it may not be the same way that you talk behind closed doors, mm-hmm. you know, and I've been behind those closed doors and I still get, I'm still behind those closed doors quite often because people feel let their guards down, let their guard down around me and speak a little more freely around me because of my appearance and in the South and the person I used to be. And you feel know? safe. And feel safe. Like racism feels safe around me. That's what's frustrating but, to me is people want to talk like. But where I'm coming from was just know. a real, just a lack of of uh, sensitivity, a lack of um, of uh, being able to have empathy, you know, to have perspective. The lack of that perspective and just go along with the flow, the easy way, the path of least resistance on how to go ahead and think because our community's already established how we should feel, you know, and not questioning that was, was my before mm. just, you know, rank and file uh-huh. Southerner. Yeah. So if we're talking about weight loss and health, you know, everyone wants to know, so what was the moment, right? That, that, that made you motivated to change and, it's a really dumb question in this context, isn't it? And yet, what like what was the process? Because like you, you always wanted to lose weight. You always wanted to be fit. You wanted to be healthy. You wanted to be sexy. You wanted to have energy. But you didn't always want to not be a racist. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing was, is I didn't think I was. Uh-huh. I honestly didn't. I thought I was a, I thought I was a new age man who the way it was, the way it was explained to me and God, I hope I don't offend people when I say these things, but I'm just trying to be honest was, you know, we were often, we often, Dustin, you can attest to this. We often heard the phrase, look, I like black people. I just hate N words. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I wasn't racist in my mind. It was just the bad ones that was a problem. And I never really understood the dynamics at play until I went back to school and I read and I looked more at at the source rather than much like in my diet. Right. Rather than just trying to fix individual symptoms like I'm fat. So let's trick it with calorie reduction or whatever. I went to the source of why those dynamics play out that way accidentally i was forced there when i went back to school and i read some books and i was forced to do research on lynching i was forced to really read and understand what the civil war was about and how ugly it was and what jim crow laws were and what reconstruction was and how that got crushed and ended right and And I just went down a rabbit hole of those things because I honestly, in the, in the beginning, I was kind of looking for a little bit of a defense of the Confederacy because I'm so tied to it through my grandfather and being from North Mississippi and be having that lineage. It, it, we used to listen to a song, a Hank Williams Jr. song said the South would have gone. If the South would have won, we'd have had it made. Hmm. We'd ride around and proudly blast that and listen to it in the boat, listen to it in the truck on the campground, on the, in the deer lease. Oh, but understanding more about actual factual history, just like I began to understand about actual factual nutrition when I started to go down the rabbit hole of a plant-based diet through your book, like, you and you and dr campbell's book especially with whole right whole is still useful to me in this is because i'm i can zoom out from the individual criminality of individuals who yes have done some harmful things and shot someone or dealt drugs or whatever but because i have an interest for the whole Hmm. right i'm interested in zooming out and understanding the history that is the impetus for these symptoms that we see today without doing that work, man, I don't know how we go forward, Howie, Hmm. in any, any realm. Yeah. What, what changed for me in my thought process was how mind blown, I guess I was uh, with the discovery of the plant-based diet and having the success with the plant-based diet and how it went against, you know, you better get your protein 
uh, thing in the South or, or everywhere nowadays, but um, just realizing how wrong I was with, with, with what I thought I already knew because of the way we were raised. Um, I knew that, that everything needed to be questioned. I felt like I had been lied to. I felt like I had been robbed years of my life because through food addiction and not really knowing truth. Mm -hmm. And it was all wrapped up from greedy people seeking profits and, and trying to trick you through marketing and, and disinformation. And, uh, I just felt like, you know, the more I uncovered those veils, the more, the more truth I wanted to find out and the less I wanted to see things from a perspective of how I fit into the, the system, I guess, air quote system. And I wanted to start learning about how I fit on the planet earth as a human mm -hmm. instead of a participant in a mm -hmm. system that was that I was participating in wanting to climb the ladder, but then figured out I was victim of some of its fakery. And it, it just, it just, it flipped my world upside down and started, I wanted to see things from a different perspective. And that perspective was instead of being a participant in that system, how do things look as a human on planet earth? And, uh, as you an know, animal, we've gotten a lot right. of stuff. We've gotten a lot of stuff wrong, right? Uh -huh. You know, and then and tradition is no excuse to hold on to it, right? Zero. Well, it's funny that you kind of have the same perspective. Like the plant based, not only sort of freed you to be healthier, but it also became a template for all of these other inquiries into truth. That like the same thing is like okay, so if I'm an animal on Earth what's what's true if that's like what are the implications of that and i can see it for movement for diet for sleep help me see it for racism love like that's what we that's what we do that's what makes human beings that's that's what brought us together that's why we've conquered continents and every, we've all oh, love drives it all in the, uh, an ability to work together as a cohesive species you know and that just seems like a good default place to be just like a plant-based biped I, I that's important to me it makes sense to me and when i look at the the real truths in in our history it's anti-love. It's the opposite. I want to go. I'm re, I am repulsed. So I'm feel compelled to go so hard in a different direction. I don't want to do it slowly and considerately. And well, you got to understand where they're coming from. I don't want to do it like that anymore. You know, that bothered me to see that bothered me. Meaning, meaning to, to be accepting and tolerant of the racism yes yes i don't Not, i don't right, want to have right. a, a, a kit gloves approach because i might get right. alienated among my family I don't, like, like i don't want right. to agree you know i don't agree with it but i just don't want to say anything right uh -huh. Not don't want to be that guy anymore and i'll tell you for because me I, I feel that saying something is is a necessity right now because if the person saying it doesn't feel any discomfort or friction what's going to put them standing in front of their mirror to maybe question whether or not they got it right mm. you know um it's you know and 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 if we say nothing but you know then we're choosing for it to be around us all the time yeah. you know we're but so, so it's so tricky, though, because like it's you, very tricky. you can have that if you can say like you guys have talked about, you know, helping your mom change and kind of and I've heard for, you know, I've heard her talk in public about how stubborn she was and how many fights she got into with you guys and, until she finally came around. But you approached your mom completely out of love. Right. There was mom. You got to change because we love you, because we want you around, because we want the best for you. You can't really go up to someone in the same way. And, mm -hmm. I mean, or, or can you? you know, like a total, 
approach of love and then and still say your attitude is part of what's killing black people. Yeah, it's it's. <sighs> I'm choosing to whether or not I'm approaching it right now as far as approaching people that, you know, uh, are having the conversation that hasn't been started. But if, if a conversation is started and something is said that I disagree with, where I may have been quiet before, I'm letting it be known that I don't think the same way. But I'm trying to do it in a way to where we can have a conversation, to where someone can eventually be enlightened and maybe have a different perspective. Because I've seen conversations go to where both parties are turned off to any other ideas because it's now anger mm. yeah. in defense. Yeah. And it's hard. It's, it's tricky. And we have a double, we have this obligation. I feel like as, as if you, for lack of a better word, woke white people or, or whatever you want to say it. I, I saw a friend of mine, post the other day that they wish they would never hear after all this i hope i never hear the word woke again well i could think of another word i wish i would never hear again <laughs> you know but we have this we have this duty as white men especially southern white men to speak to other white people about the things they don't know because we all went to school together we all went to the hunting camps and fishing camps together we played in the football we've played on the football teams together so we have this duty to help educate and enlighten them in, in, in a way that, you know, like there's no male Jane Elliott in this that I can that I'm aware of, you mm -hmm. know, type individual. So especially as white men, we have this duty to, to say it's OK to be compassionate, right, to it's communicate so, that it's OK to show empathy. It's yet OK the, to change your, your perspective. Right? Yet at the same time, you get shunned. You get it feels bristly to have that, to do that. And yet, how dare I be uncomfortable with that? How dare I be uncomfortable with dealing with that? You know, there are people that walk around with black skin every second of the day and they don't get to, ah, oh, this makes me uncomfortable. Let me calculate whether I'm going to deal with this or not deal with this based on how I want to continue communicating with this person and playing three-dimensional chess over it. No, when you say something stupid, it should have an equal and opposite effect immediately, I think. And that is when you, I heard, and maybe it just hit me the wrong way, but when I heard George Floyd um, call for his mom, I knew he was dying. It was, it was because I had, Heard my Bam Bam do the same thing. He probably hadn't seen his mama in 60 years or no, probably, you know, 45, 50 years. Mm. And when I heard him saying, mama, I knew it wasn't long. Mm. And and for, and I knew immediately they were going to attack that man's criminal record. It's the moment he died, I post, that was my first post about it. And I mean, Damn, if I'm a, I'm, I'm not gonna sit quiet. I'm gonna piss off white people. I'm sorry. And it's, and is it gonna hurt me? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna hurt us. As I mean, we have we, we do business in the community. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, but who am I to complain about that part of it? That wrinkle. I. That's not you know. And right. so, so you've you've yeah, cho sorry. You, you've you've chosen to make it not a choice anymore. You've right. Like, yeah, it's so, like when when Dustin said, like, we choose to it's like, yeah, we choose to. And we've decided to stop choosing like it's now it's now who we've committed to being regardless of cost, because otherwise we if we if we take cost into a, into account, that's privilege. Because black people well, I mean, and don't get to do that. Just like exactly. the plant based diet, if you talk about it, but don't do it, you won't get the results. Yeah. And so we can say it, but unless our in our actions every day, do, you know, follow through with it, then at the end of the day, you don't get results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why I'm, you know, 
I'm saying something now and not just let it roll off, roll off because in the past I might take the approach. Well, nobody was around to hear it, that, that it would have offended, you know, the people in the room are all of the same color or whatever. So, you know, no harm, no file, but that's, that can't, that can't go on because all that is, is giving a signal to them that I, feel the same way you co-signed it I've you co-signed, co-signed it by with not, quiet right, right correct and i want it to be known that's bullshit that is bullshit if that's gonna be you do do you but i want you to know that when you let your guard down and talk that way around me you're gonna be hit with resistance <laughs> i'm not on your team yeah i want mm-hmm. you to know that i'm not with you on that part and that i think it's bullshit and then if you want to have a talk about it then i will try to enlighten you I will try to give you some things to look at or documentary to watch or different perspectives to see things from so you can maybe understand a little more. But if all you have is hatred in your heart to just talk about stuff like that, I'm not going to ignore it, you know, and not and not say something. And it might it might eventually get that person to not want to be around me. But so be it. I don't want to be around that that toxicity. So when you guys talk about, you know, your transition to plant based diet, you you talk about like what you learned, what you discovered, some facts. And I think that's been really helpful for people like Missing Chins Run Club, like other guys like yourself who are basically pragmatic. And it's like if you, you know, like people who hunt and fish for a living can't live in a world of theory. Right. Or people who fix electrical equipment or sewer pumps. You can't say like, this is my belief. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't actually work. So we actually tried that before. (laughs) Yeah. Like reality will slap you. And I think, yes, I, you know, from, from having, having hung out with you guys and seeing your community, there's a real pragmatic streak. Like when people know better, when they, they bump up against reality, they very often adapt and change. So like, can you talk about in the same way you talk about, well, I discovered intramyocellular lipids and, and this and that. Can you talk about like specifically some things you learned that changed your views on race? For me, it was um, just reading the, the, the lightning and it's going to be so cliche and so boring, but the lightning bolt was reading to kill a mockingbird that was huge that was a huge shift for me you know i could go back further for me um and talk about the da vinci code how the the, da vinci you know you and i have had this conversation before where i read the da vinci code and as a good little christian baptist boy who who did his mischievous stuff but in secret like you should (laughs) right when I read the Da Vinci Code, it shook the foundation of all of that for me. And it made and it started to crack my psyche. It cracked my psyche ever so slightly. My wife had been raised, my wife has been raised Catholic, and she has a different relationship, a more business-like relationship with Christianity than I did as a as a Southern Baptist. Right. And so she turned me on to that, and we talked about some of the I was looking through history at some of the facts about religion and all of these things. And I was like, wow, it's just really interesting. And it starts to start, starts to sort of break the seal on, on those canned like dogmas that you've had, that you just blindly upheld for all of your life. And so with that, after, after, reading that really controversial title i also read angels and demons and i went down that rabbit hole and um so fast forward to my the reading that book is what read me to being a prolific reader which made bj my wife suggest maybe you should go back to school josh so then i go back to school and that's when i read to kill a mockingbird in my very first semester and it and then i went watch a play and then of To Kill a Mockingbird at, at Nichols State University, and it really moved me. And I was feeling more enlightened about what I had just assumed all of my life. 
you know, racism was bad, but oh, they got a place to live for free. And, you know, they wasn't too bad. I mean, think about it. They own them. So they're not going to beat them up too bad. You don't want to mess up your own property. Like that was the arguments in our brain, in my brain. But to be able to have that spilled open in glory, not glory, but gory, disgusting truth with this is so recent. There's black and white images, photographs of these people. That was profound to me to go down that rabbit hole um, from reading To Kill a Mockingbird to reading more nuanced things like 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 passing or or um, invisible man. Right. And and Googling and just going down the rabbit hole of lynches like you think lynching, you think, oh, a person getting hung. No. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No. Go look at the images involved with that word. And then to understand as a because I'm a history buff, I love history and to understand the, the role that my specific region had in slavery, in the slave trade, in Jim Crow era, in New Orleans's role in the end of Reconstruction. That was powerful to me. And it makes me want to be a force opposite of those great forces going in a different direction. And you're going to get you're going to create some targets on yourself doing that, you know, but that's where you got to build the education. For me, I built, I built that sort of knowledge base and education, really looking for excuses to be proud of the Confederacy, even though it wasn't PC to do so. And I couldn't find any of that. I couldn't find any of that. All I found was disgust and horror and disappointment in my ancestors. Um, not that I should have been ignorant to it because I've heard these stories from the mouth of my grandfather, who was himself a police chief. We dealt with a police officer in my family. My grandfather behaved like a police officer for the rest of his life out in our trailer park. He stomped the ground. I've seen him take people's license plate because they were doing 15 miles an hour instead of 10 miles an hour. Not a joke. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway, it takes a big force to move away from what what we were taught like that. And that going down that rabbit hole of American literature and having a wife, having someone on my side that sees me interested and encourages that and then pushes and says, no, don't just take a little, take a lot. Go learn even more. Even go get your degree. Be real ballsy about it. And that is what led me to that path, that just education. And it's, and it's like not even anything about what I went to school for. That's not the biggest value I got out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. It was just that sending me, giving me specific places to spend my desire to read at the time, you know? Yeah. Dustin, what about you? What, what, what were the what were the learnings that helped you change? First of all, just understanding that it was OK to question what I thought the way, you know, the way things were. OK. Um, and I never really thought about I mean, just and I'm just going to throw a parallel like with hunting. Hunting was a thing that wasn't really in my heart. It was something I did because I thought it was what you were supposed to do, hmm. right? I thought it was what you were supposed to do. And I would hear these conversations behind closed doors and then go to school, and I had certain friends that those same conversations were very derogatory towards. And I didn't understand it. It wasn't in my heart, but I didn't. I just, I just went with it because I thought it was what the thing to do. And I didn't have the courage to question it until I questioned what I needed to sustain life as far as food goes. And once I did, once, once I understood it was okay to question it is, it was like the box was open to, to just forget about everything else. It's okay to think everything else is total bullshit. 
It's okay to understand it and just admit that you were wrong because those things are going to be barriers to get you where you need to be to be enlightened and to be more educated on it. And one of breaking that barrier was the beginning of wanting to dig deeper about every all these different happenings that ha- that happened in this country that is squashed and you don't really hear about, you know different occurrences in different small communities and big communities that you just, that you don't hear about. You never taught it in school, in history. You never, uh, th- nobody locally ever talks about it. You know, you pass down different garden, re- different gardening tricks and different pot crawfish pie recipes, but you don't talk about that thing that happened, you know, because it's not that important. It wasn't, you know, it didn't happen to us. And, um, just, really take an interest in mass incarceration um, and what happened in the 80s really opened my eye to to what how different laws were put in a, in place just to be able to attack certain communities can you talk, talk about that more like what's what like I, I'm imagining this podcast is for people like like I think everyone listening to this podcast will say I'm not a racist Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't hate anybody. We should all get along. We should all love each other. And a lot of people are thinking, you know, we should be nice to them. They should be nice to us. We shouldn't riot. We shouldn't rock the boat. Yes, there's been bad things, but there's also good people. You guys are really far beyond that in terms of what needs to be done and systemic changes. So I'm imagining we're talking to people who may be thinking some of the things that I just said and think that their responsibility is just to treat everybody equally and like and to not recognize that to to do that in a profoundly unequal unjust society is to side with the oppressor so can you can you talk about mass incarceration right. teach us right. well i mean in, in the beginning of the early 80s we we had a number south of 300,000 people um that were incarcerated and uh throughout the 80s with the war on drugs that Nixon had started and the in the and the Reagan uh, administration pushed um, was were they were enforcing laws that were put into place to disenfranchise certain communities and in the 80s when private for for-profit prisons were created right you you now have this new way to take back rights that were given awarded to people through civil rights movements you have a, a you know you know a, a legal way to yeah. take it back you have a, a righteous reason now to take back all of these rights just because you created laws to incarcerate that made things that were being done already um, illegal just to attack certain communities and and in doing so, and fill for-profit prisons. To fill for-profit prisons, no doubt. But we never want to look at the butterfly effect or the trajectory of all of these families that have to go on with life without their loved ones. It could be the dad, the brother, or the, the cousin, or whoever it is. They could be very, the grandpa, anybody very important in their life. If they get thrown in, in jail and the key thrown away forever for some BS, right? right? And me, the trajectory me, of that family, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't go unaffected. Right. And just to be clear, what we're talking about, marijuana use among whites and blacks right. is essentially the same. And black people are five times more likely to be put in jail for marijuana use than white people. Correct. Exactly. Right. Josh, what were you going to say? No, I forgot. I okay. don't remember. What were, I don't remember. What? Just, about yeah, the, we're about just the for profit, for, for, you're going to talk more about the for profit prisons. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't remember exactly what we were, uh, okay. what we were, yeah. what we were going to talk about. In a specific about, documentary yeah. that really, that that really opened my eyes eyes to what was going on was the documentary Thirteenth, um, mm-hmm. and it was about about it was it just kind of laid out the detailed. Um, uh, blueprints of how they did what they did and what they currently have. And, you know, um, it's, I just think we need a lot more attention, a lot I, more lights. I remember now, like <laughs> I've always thought about, you know, and because my Bam Bam was a police officer, I always thought about police as 
they were defending us against oftentimes black people because that's where all the crime is duh in my mind back then right Mm -hmm. and and as i've become more educated with things like 13th having having black friends that say hey you ever heard of this you ever heard of that that and i go down these rabbit holes then you understand that the police are actually on the offense for us as white people, they're going into underserved communities. They're looking for trouble. They're looking for someone out of place. So you could have some probable cause. Just like I just saw a, young, a, a guy body slam. Just This is just a couple of days ago. He wasn't even the right guy, but he was in the right neighborhood and he had the right skin color that went to where a, a, an accident of an officer slamming you to the ground so hard it breaks your wrist is highly likely. I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen with me anytime I'm around jogging. Yeah. And yeah, that bothers me. Yeah. It's funny how Ahmed Arbery kind of radicalized the missing chins a little bit. It did. And I think it's just, I think, and I don't want, I don't, I don't think enough is made of this. Um, I think because he was a runner and because he was running, maybe it's superficial and it shouldn't mean as much as I think it did, but I think it did mean a lot to a lot more white people Mm -hmm. because of the running community at large felt like they saw him as a runner, you know, and it was, it was a tragedy and it was terrible and it was I know it sparked me in a different way, you know. I know, yeah. and well, yeah. when I when I go out on the when I go out around town, like we all have these filters, right? And for white people, I'm thinking for everyone in America, one of the big filters is your skin color, but mm-hmm. there's other filters as well. Like if you see someone wearing Saints clothes, you know, you're in Oregon, say, and you see someone with the fleur de lis, you're like my people, yeah. right? So when, when we are runners, who, who da? When we when we're runners. And this is such a big part of our identity. And you see a runner the, like that goes foreground. Skin color goes background. Right. Yes. And there's a there's a new kind of there's a community that gets knit together. And when 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 you see someone from your running community gunned down in the act of running, I think that that breaks through some stuff. Yes, I think that that that. I think that shifted a lot of white people's psyche. Um, you know, like there wasn't enough, right. but, you know, previous. Um, and I feel like there's just a, I think there's been a, a seismic shift, even though, you know, even, even here, like even here, and as much as I want to, as much as I want to complain, because the, because the naysayers are what, take up the biggest space in your mind the the private messages i get from cousins mm. even though it's a single human it's like that person takes up a big part of my mind when there's so many other people who have contacted me and said josh i don't you know it's tricky for me i don't like it i don't comment on it but keep posting what you're posting i love it baby mm. you're getting them you know mm-hmm. and and so I'm proud of those. I'm proud of that, you know. Uh, but yeah, there's some there's sticking your face out into this into this uh, area of discussion in the South uh, as a white guy is gonna it's gonna be complicated. It's gonna be very uncomfortable, and rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully so. I think it's the I think it's the elephant in the room that's never been addressed that has to be addressed in order for our mm-hmm. the the you know the South especially but the country as a whole to move forward. Yeah. We just have to we have to address we have to have the conversations we have to educate we have to understand the past in order to be able to empathize with what's going on. If we just take the opinions of the people who raised us and use that as fact, then we're never going to change. We're never here. We're never going to fix it. Right. We have to be, it has to be okay 
to admit that you were wrong. It is okay to admit that you were wrong and to evolve by taking the good and, f- and flaking the bad, man. And that's the yeah. only way we can move forward. Yeah. Word. So I don't, I don't know if you guys are comfortable talking about this, but I, I want to ask you about your mom. Cause you guys are, I guess, millennials or. I'm Gen- an old ass millennial. Old but ass. I'm not Al- really. Yeah. Almost Gen X. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, okay. But a little, a little younger, a little more woke. Your mom is what in her sixties. Yeah. Yes. And she has made a big shift. I follow her on Facebook. She's posting. She just did a, a birthday fundraiser for the Southern Poverty Law Center. What was it like? What, I mean, can, I don't want you to speak for her, but what was it like as her children watching her shift? I mean, she's Bam Bam's daughter. Yeah. Uh, in a word, relieving. It was soothing. It's Re- re- relaxing to the soul because I see friends of mine post things on Facebook and have their very own mom in the comments make some contradictory gaslighting comment and it's like thank God thank God I don't have that between me and my mama you know and it makes it it, it it's a proud moment to see that my mom's able to be open-minded enough to change and to, and to, because in order to to feel necessity to change, you have to question and what you've been doing for 60 some odd years. Right. Mm -hmm. But I really truly believe that it, it's, it's in everybody in a natural form or fashion, some kind of way it's in everybody to want to care and to want to help. Mm Mm-hmm. Some people are not strong enough to stand up to the resistance to let that part show. And if we can make that, if we can make that to be okay, it's okay to show compassion is not weakness, right? To evolve is not weakness. It's not to go against your, what you've been taught. It's to move forward. Yeah. And to become better. I'm yeah. not kneeling to the liberal left, as has been charged in right. private messages in boxes, from my but I'm, I've been thrown in the vegan box when I start talking about a plant-based diet, right? When people, when it gets outside of what there's too much to hear, it's like, okay, that's too much specifics. I've already boxed you up in this box. This is you, mm-hmm. you know? So now when I speak out on certain topics, that's what, you know, you get thrown in this box that... Oh, okay. Ball you up. Here you are over here. I'm just going to find a simple, I'm going to find a simple word <laughs> to not have to really use too much breath on explaining your stance. Uh-huh. He's right. a Democrat. Correct. All right. All right. So, I mean, the other thing that's, that comes to me is doing, Josh, you said like the reason you changed was love. And mm-hmm. like your mother is one of the most compassionate, giving, loving people I've ever met. And so, like, in some ways, she went on a huge journey. And in some ways, she didn't go on a journey at all. Yeah. You know, she's just being herself, more of herself. That's what's so beautiful, Howie, because my mama has fought that for her whole life. She's she's fought against being just gushing with love hmm. um, for the sake of fitting and trying to make up for the fact that she had a kid when she was a teenager and trying to scratch and claw and get a house with my dad and save the money and do the thing like just, and you got to have a certain heartlessness, a certain coldness to you to be able to achieve in this capitalist world. And to see my mom be able to release all of those things and to be able to say, Oh, okay. Yeah. We're not going to get rich. I'm cool. Yeah, she's she's just she's found the strength to let the light shine that was already in her. I'm gonna be free. I'm already happy. Wow, look at my children. They get along. All of them talk to one another. I have grandbabies. I've mm. never seen my mom so happy in my figuring entire out life. the overweight part was rich enough for her. That was wealth. That was all the yeah. wealth because I've seen her fight it her whole life. Uh-huh. And hold her back and keep her down. 
Wow. We went to Disney World when I was 15, and we had to stop. And it was like, my dad was the exact opposite. My dad wanted to see how fast we could make it through Disney World. He wanted like a Guinness Book World Record trip through Disney World. <laughs> my mom was over 300 pounds at the time, you know, bad back. She's got an 18-inch stainless steel rod in her spine from scoliosis. Um, and so we had to keep waiting on mom and go back, circle back, let mom rest. And then now mom now my mom dad's working his butt off but mom can mom can walk circles around my dad <laughs> you know and but now it's it's cool because they like in a little competition i yeah. think dad might even be dad's edging dead. her out a little bit right now so you know we're gonna see how it uh -huh. plays out in the long run but it's beautiful to watch them and i gotta say my dad too completely <laughs> just blossoming because my dad just as a as a as you know sort of what you would call it, uh, like through osmosis, has absorbed a lot of this uh, um, racial justice knowledge right alongside the things that my mom has been digesting. And to see the corner that my dad has turned, mm. you know, it's mm. been really cool. Mm. It's been really, really cool to watch him go, wow, I didn't have any idea about Tulsa. That's, that is disturbing. Mm. Yeah. And one, one thing that really struck me about what you just said is that your mom is free, uh, free to show her love. It's like working for racial justice. It's like the most selfish thing white people can do. Like we're, we, you know, we, we got this savior complex, like we have to save the black people who are enslaved and we have to help them. Like we are enslaved until, yes. until we can love as freely without without regard for who the person is when we can hear people when we don't have to put them into boxes when we don't have to fear the separation right that's that's freedom right right um, and that concept doesn't work well on the oil rig or at the shipyard it's dangerous mm -hmm. and i understand so that's a very real dynamic in the fabric of the community that i live in you know so there's that there's that where and I love those cats, just like I love my Bam Bam who says all the wrong shit. You know, I want to help if I can. You know, I want to be able to to make them feel like it's OK to believe this way, to think this way, to, you know, vote this way. <laughs> and um, so that's a journey unto itself. And it has nothing to do really with black people or my black friends. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel compelled. I feel compelled to try to bring around my white people, my white brothers and sisters. That's who, that's what's most important to me. You know, uh, Eugene Cook um, at, at the Asheville Veg Fest, the Grow Where You Are guy, uh -huh. he would, his talk was profound on me. And it was that he talked about that savior complex where, you want to help the black community? And he's like, that was the most absurd thing that someone earlier in the in the in the talk had said, we need to get more black people to be vegan. And the crowd went crazy. Right. And he and he's like, here's the thing, guys, when he got his chance to talk. None of y'all know who Dr. Sebi is. None of y'all know. None of y'all have ever heard of Rastafari. None of y'all have never. Right. He's like, how dare you say that we you need to help black people get on board with a, the value of a plant based diet? Yeah. What you need to do is help white people. They got plenty of white people that need to get on board. And that's where you have agency. That's where you speak the language. Don't come into my neighborhood because you got a pile of money from daddy and you and your trust fund and you want to help the community. Nah, you got to be more subservient than that if you really want to help. And what you need to do is you need to turn around and talk to daddy who gave you all that money and get him to stop using the N-word. And that shook me. And exploiting people to make that money. Huh. Right. That shook me. And I was like, ah, okay, yes. My black brothers and sisters are just fine. They got problems. They have, they're dealing with them. They are capable humans the best way i can help is try to help communicate 
in a white way to other white people about what it is that I see, that I've learned, that I know is going on, that you're numb to. Because we went through the same school system. We learned the same way. Yeah. So that's what's important yeah, to you, me. Yeah, you mentioned Tulsa, and I'm not making any assumptions about people who are listening. What's Tulsa? So Tulsa, Oklahoma was a place where not long after, uh, what was it, 50 years or so after the end of slavery, um, there, m much like much like Claiborne Avenue here in New Orleans, there was a really strong, um, uh, wealthy black community, rich, on, not rich in money, but just rich in entrepreneurship, rich in rich in ideas and in and in organization. And um, it was called the Black Wall Street. And and ultimately, um, there was a race riot that was spurred by um, an accusation on a on a young black man. And the the two sides sort of squared off against one another. Wrongful ac accusation. They want to pull him out and lynch him. And they said, no, nah, not that's not going to happen. And it just descends into m mayhem. And they undo the white people undo with killings and bur going inside people's homes and dragging them out, and beating the shit out of them and killing them and setting churches on fire. And it was you burned it, all it was in plain sight. It was in plain sight. Um, and we don't learn of these things, not in a real profound way, because even if you have a teacher who's told to teach this stuff in South Louisiana, he's going to go either go over it really quickly or mitigate for the white people. Or he's probably a, a Confederate, um, a Confederate apologist at heart anyway. So he's going to skew everything because I'm thinking about my very own Louisiana history teacher. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, so that's how that's how people don't know what Tulsa that's how people don't know about Tulsa that's how people don't really understand the deep history and grossness of lynching you know yeah. you know I learned last week that New York Central Park was built on a a, a town of free blacks that's exactly right yeah like I did not know that, that until last week yep yeah. Uh, so you guys mentioned twice. I, w I don't know that I was going to go there, but you mentioned t about sort of capitalism twice. Yeah. And so here's here's a no, no place because vegans, we love capitalism because we're going to you know, we're going to get the uh, the big investor in the plant based cheese company or the plant based meat company. <laughs> and we want to scale and like we have issues with that because like there's there's a relationship between the capitalist economy and racism, is there not? Yes, I, definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm the the willingness to to unplug from from wanting to be a part of be in that and and chase the same things that a lot of capitalists do. Um, being able to 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 remove that as a goal of mine has enabled me. To become enlightened on, enlightened on other on other topics, right? So like it, it changed my perspective. You know, wanting to get out of that changed my perspective. My perspective because I wanted to be more of a human on planet Earth than I wanted to be a participant in a capitalist society and 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 the and and do the things that were necessary to be deemed successful within those rules or that structure right which because <clears throat> to be successful within that capitalistic structure in most minds is you know financial gain a disproportionate collection of capital Correct. and assets and the more disproportionate the more successful the more you got the better you did it and that's not a model that it just that's not it doesn't work. It has nothing to do with balance, nothing to do with nature, nothing. I think about the, 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 the um, you know, anti-fragility and the lessons taught in that book that, that you very 
wisely t- turned me on to. And yeah, I just feel like, you know, through gov- through subsidies from the government, we've re- we've removed a lot of the things that would have corrected markets. We call ourselves a free market capitalist society. Yeah, we are free market until shit hits the fan. And then all of a sudden we throw in trillions of dollars of quantitative easing at, at the free market. Hmm. Um, and so that 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 North Star of capital. I, I lost it. I don't want, I don't care. I don't want it anymore. It was the, like, I don't want that. What I want is sustainable happiness in my life. And I think everybody wants that. And what, however, I, as an individual need to behave to try to encourage that, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stub my toe along the way and trying to live that way. Um, But that's that's my North Star more than capital Mm. is happiness. It's togetherness. It's meeting people like you, how you become like like a brother to me yourself. And you you have further inspired me to not give a shit about all of those. You one of the smartest humans I know. And. You don't care about the trappings of capitalistic success. And that matters to me. Well, and, you know, the thing to me is what I, when I learned that to be a good capitalist in this country. And I'm, I'm going to use my my me being overweight as part of my, my example is for the people that 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 hold the true knowledge that can really help me become healthy hold that knowledge semi hostage in order to perpetuate my visits to them in order to be deemed successful one day within that structure meanwhile you know my true growth gets gets held up and gets held hostage in the name of making money and if i have to do that to someone else in order to have those things to be deemed successful in that structure, then I'm not playing, I'm not playing ball. I don't want to play ball. I feel that is just too, too dishonest of a way to, to, to live life. It, it's, it's, it's not in alignment with balance. Um, and I just think it's, I just think it's a lot of toxicity there and not, and not sustainable. And um, so, therefore, I want to figure out how to live, just like Josh said, a more happy, sustainable, have a more happy, sustainable existence. And the fact that I've found my health, it relieves me a lot of a lot of pressure to, to go get other things that might be able to buy my health, even though it can't really be bought. Right. Or or to right. buy distraction from your unhealth. Correct. From my discomfort of being unhealthy, you know, to to think I can re- buy that happiness is just, was was just the um, an illusion. Yeah. yeah. I wonder. I wonder really. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder how big the racism industry is in America is, in terms no. of, I don't know, antidepressants, firearms, um, alcohol. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Prisons. Yes. Certain political parties. And yeah. it's just like, you know, it's just like the world suddenly like or the country suddenly shift into a plant based diet. It's just so it's oh just so financially ingrained. It would literally break us. The same thing with racism. If it would it would just. And how how does that feel? That feels hmm. terrible. That's yeah. not good. That we are that our our current society's existence is based on these these fundamental lies and cruelties. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what that what what I'm saying the world should look like. I don't yeah. have the answers, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to some extent, that's the safest 
that's the most responsible thing to say. Mm -hmm. It's like we don't we don't know what the new story is going to look like. And that doesn't mean we don't have the courage to step to step out of the old one. Mm -hmm. You know, Correct. you know, it's like opening opening a door into a dark room. It's like, well, you're going to fumble around till you find the light switch. But it that's doesn't it. it doesn't mean you can't you you know you don't go, don't enter the room until it's already light. That ain't gonna work. Nope, that's it, man. That's it. And we learned that from Bam. We learned that from my Bam Bam because that's the way we approached every problem. Never heard of this before. I never made a retaining wall before. I wonder how we do that. I never, you know, how many times we broke out the. We made a freaking fry pot one time out of an old uh, uh, yes. disc. Off of a you know farm disc. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and he took out the brazen rod, and we made a little piece of. We made a rim around the disc, and he's like, his theory was you could have a little pool in the middle of the disc of hot oil, so you could fry your eggs and stuff in there. But then the outer rim of the disc would be dry enough and high enough to where you could lay toast on there and you could cook your toast and fry your eggs in the middle and new bacon in between. <laughs> and so it could be, you know, and it was an, a camp invention. And how, frick, yeah. how many freaking times we've used that thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's fu It's funny when you, when you talk about him, aside from the details of the hatred that he learned growing up and perpetuated, like how much kinship he has with black culture, right? Like if Correct. you if you take if that's you, the, if you take something and you sort of like use use something lying around in an innovative way and make it work, that's called ghetto. Yeah. <laughs> My Bam Bam was raised on a cotton plantation, Simmons Plantation in North Mississippi. His daddy, my big pop, was an overseer, white man, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. My Bam Bam told me stories of when he was little and he used to play with the little black kids and he would get in trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when you poor white people and you're on the same plantation as poor black people, the only thing that makes you better, the only thing that sets you apart is your whiteness. And my big pop instilled that in his kids. Mm -hmm. And and um, it perpetuates yeah. to this day. Yeah. It just does. Which is, the, yeah. I think, the, the other link that I'm learning about capitalism and racism is that racism was a secondary outcome of the need for the upper class to make sure that the lower classes didn't unite. Right. So we thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. So we the give... famous uh, LBJ quote about, you know, if you can, I, I can't remember, you'll you'll know it. I don't remember it, but it speaks to exactly this. Like uh, what about being um, rather on the inside of the tent pissing out than on the outside of the tent pissing in. No, it was about. Yeah. If you, if you could just convince a poor white person mm. that he's better than a black person, you can take all his money mm. or something to that effect or yeah. something like that. And so that's kind of, you know. That's kind of what we got going on. Right. So now, you know, now I'm learning about sort of the history of whiteness and where it came from. And, you know, what I'm learning is that racism is not about hatred. It's not about ignorance. It's about greed. And it is used to justify that greed and to keep a very small upper class, give them control over mm -hmm. everybody else by pitting people against one another. Yes, correct. And but, capitalism shores that whole thing up. And, and one way they do it is to the people that, that want to be in that small group of the upper class, they get told that the reasons they can't reach those those higher levels are because of people below them mm -hmm. that, that, you know, take all of the free stuff is mm -hmm. how they put it, right? But they don't want to educate themselves on, where ta on how taxpayer, taxpayer dollars are spent 10 times that sometimes in corporate and in, in, in other corporate subsidies, yeah, corporate welfare, and corporate welfare. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And and so it's a it's kind of a, a, de, a deflection of hatred or a deflection of anger from where the true cause is to 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 people beneath them. Right. So and, and to keep people bickering, like you said, will do nothing other than to ensure their place at the top. So for folks, oh, let's, oh, I want to let you guys go because you've been sitting 
in this. I, I feel like I'm like your school teacher keeping you in detention, like sitting in this no, little, as if little I'm car. Enjoying, enjoying conversation uh, with my buddy. Um, but for folks who who are curious, who want to start going down a rabbit hole, let's let's say they're they'll say they, they go, you know what? I want to devote two hours to understanding racism and my and how it's infected me and what I can start to do about it. Where would you send them? First of all, I say don't be such a time uh, tight wide. Two <laughs> hours is nothing. However, start with start with 13th, I would say. I don't know about that's you, a, Dustin. That's a, that's, that's a good one. It's new. It's modern. It explains a hell of a lot of stuff. And for something with a little bit more of a, a real personal touch for extra credit, it's going to take longer than two hours. But look at a story just to understand the convoluted nature of what we're dealing with. Look at the Khalif Browder story. It's a multiple episode series. Um, and just un put yourself in that young man's shoes. As a 15 year old boy, I know I've done some dumb shit at 15, right? And just put your man, put yourself in his shoes and then let, let that empathy that hopefully grows from, from that, let that empathy guide you down the rabbit hole that uh, 13th will definitely bring you, I think. Yes. 13th shines a big light on a lot of a lot of practices um, that are currently still happening today. Yep. And it's, you know, it's 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 nauseating and it's disgusting that um, that we just kind of act like it's not happening because it's not happening to us. Yeah. Yep. And alt right is another good one. I think that those are two. I think if they play well with each other, for you to really kind of run to like get a full scope mm -hmm. of what not only you know what's happening, how systemically this has happened to black people over over the gen the couple the few generations since slavery, only just a few, and 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 how active. And on the offense, the white power, white supremacist, white nationalist movement is and how mainstream they're starting to morph their rhetoric to actually be involved with current campaigns for current politicians. Mm -hmm. But they have a more mainstream face with a suit and a tie now, uh -huh. you know, with like what was the what was that? Uh, remember the. um something uh renaissance american renaissance mm -hmm. that yeah those people look up american renaissance that's the new that's the that's the new white power talk that's and you when you hear about the american renaissance and that meant you oh all of these people that are posting on facebook they are get they may be third or fourth hand but they are getting the information spewed by this movement by this american renaissance organization you know which is a fancy thing for just the new age kkk mm. so spend more than two hours but if you only got to do 13th i would say 13th is, is a very good one and there's a new one out on uh, uh, a new documentary out on uh, true justice true justice true is justice great. is a good one. Oh, it's <clears throat> good one it shows you how the whole the system as a whole can completely fail you if you have the wrong color skin Hmm. And it is pretty gut wrenching on, on you know, on on what happened, and there's and it's just this it's just scratching the surface on on how many times it's happened. Yep. It's crazy. And me and Dustin know we've been in we've had touch points with the law in our lives, and you know I've gotten away a lot more than what he's gotten away with. He's actually gotten arrested <laughs> more than me probably. However, we neither one of us have been treated quite the way we see um, our black brothers and sisters getting treated. I know, and I know on these videos, those are, those are a drop in the bucket. I get, cause that's the argument that I get from white people, man. It could, I can find just as many videos of black, white people suffering from, um, you know, uh, brutal policing or whatever the case. And, but that's not really the, that's, that's not the point to me, you know? Um, it's to me, it's, I have been in trouble 
with police before. I should have gone to jail several times. And I was also given the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And even though my brother has actually wound up in the clink a little bit more, maybe once or twice more than me. I don't mean to put him on blast, but it's probably yeah, it's true. Just, it's just matter of fact. Drunken aggression right? and fighting stuff. You know? <laughs> so, but neither one of us wound up dead. You know, neither one of us really thought that we would wind up dead. We weren't really concerned about police brutality on us. If we if we got police brutality, we figured we probably deserved it because mm. we was cutting up, you know. Um, yeah, that yeah. I yeah. we know. I just I don't know. It, I, I can see how the system works differently for different people right. without too much more detail and a whole bunch of other stories. Right. So I want to ask you one more thing, and, and it might be too painful to talk about, but yeah. Saints tickets. Ha! Yeah. So here's the cool thing about that. I decided, uh, me and my wife both, you know, pretty early on, um, after, uh, you know, Drew Brees said what he said, to be frank, I'm just saying. You know, um, I completely disagreed with his first statement and it just just uh -huh. really. Well, you know, this may shock you, but some people may, listening may not know who Drew Brees is. So Drew Brees is the quarterback of my beloved New Orleans Saints. I still love the Saints. I'm still a Saints fan. I've been having season tickets with my wife. Um, we've been buying them from a friend for the same the same seats for what, 10 years or so now. Yeah. And Drew Brees is the quarterback of that team who has taken us to a Super Bowl, a Super Bowl that was a huge part of my impetus for change as I lost the weight and changed everything about my life. It changed my whole grind. It changed right. everything. And, and arguably, um, he's the best quarterback of all time. Arguably the best quarterback of all time. And you'll fight anyone and, who's uh, just Tom Brady. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not interested. I don't even know who that is. And then um, uh, he needs a haircut. Uh, but yeah. And so Drew had the opportunity to say something about the, the, about, um, the potentiality of people kneeling p this, this, uh, season during the national anthem, talking about what had Ka what Kaepernick had started back a few years ago. And he had that in that opportunity. He took that opportunity to, to immediately, um, basically say that it's he's designating it disrespectful. He doesn't care why Kaepernick says he does it. He doesn't care about anything else. All he's he's deeming it disrespectful and he's not going to stand for someone disrespecting the flag. And I thought it was completely dismissive of such a big topic that needs to be talked about in a real way. It disgusted me. It bothered me. And I made a post about it, about how how uh, disgusted I was. And I got in a bunch of comment thread fights over that, honestly, with people who I love dearly. Honestly, Howie, it's very tricky. But in that moment, I'm like, how can I complain? And he did make an apology that was somewhat acceptable, but he's been pretty quiet on the subject since then. But at that moment... How can I explain, and I talked to you about it, how can I explain spending money on those season tickets yet having such a problem with the man making the absolute most on the whole team? How can I How can I do that? How can I feel good about myself as a white guy to plunk that kind of money on a ticket that's ultimately, in part at least, paying Drew Brees' salary when... If I have that kind of expendable cash, if I have that kind of disposable income, who am I to not spend it where it could help this current situation? So I would rather do that. So that's what my wife and I both decided to do this year is to just forego our season tickets, um, take a knee, if you will, this season. <laughs> and... Um, and we're just going to donate money in ways we see fit that matches what our season tickets would have been. Yeah. And 
and some people will not understand how big this is, but others will. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm curious right now, how what what items of clothing are you wearing that have the Saints logo on them? Um, actually, just my socks right now. <laughs> But there's always one because you know me well, bro. <laughs> yeah, well, I never get dressed without something Saints. Yeah, so this, I mean, I don't want to hold this. But up. it's my, it's it's my, uh, it's my Michael Thomas socks now. It's not my Drew Brees socks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and it's silly to hold this up as like an act of courage compared to some, and yet, it is a tangible step that goes beyond what a lot of white liberals are doing, which is posting virtuous things yeah. and not changing their lives. And so I, I want to, yeah. I want to just and the of... gratuitous photos of people with their black friends is like, <clears throat> like that's, that's not okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dustin, any final thoughts from you? I know you're, 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 you don't have season tickets. So you're, you're, no, I don't. You're a fan, but not to that extent. I am a fan, but uh, don't have season tickets. Uh, no, just, just. Um, he did just, for a little while. Well, it's just a, it's a little much for. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I I'd much rather watch him on television. Yeah. I'd much rather be. A, me and Dusty are brothers, and we look awful lot alike, but we are very different in certain ways, you know. Uh -huh. uh, socially, especially, I think that we, we, we get down a little bit differently, you know. Oh, yeah. definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, but I was, I, you know, I've been uncomfortable in social settings most of my life, you know. I'm just now starting to be comfortable in high-volume uh, mm -hmm. settings, you know what I mean, of, of different people. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah. But... Yes. Any now, any, any uh, closing thoughts on this this whole conversation? Nothing other than the fact that uh, you know, just kind of like what y'all were just finishing up with, you know, you can say all you want, but your actions is the only thing that's really going to change. I mean, that's you know, I I'm just trying to you know, just do what I'm going to do, and 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 try to just change every day. Just try and do the little change, like. Be a little resistant to the next person that feels comfortable talking about some derogatory, uh, say, throw some derogatory words at some some of our peers just because of the color of their skin. Uh, instead of just letting it, you know, roll off my back or not say anything, I'm just going to let it be known that I, I disagree, you know, and it doesn't have to be an argument. It's just that I disagree and hopefully show through actions how it can be done for somebody else. Instead of just telling people, you know, it's, you know, because the way the way that messages have resonated with me is by me seeing people doing it, not being told to do it. Mm -hmm. And and that's just, you know, what yeah. where I'm going to try and leave it, you know. Yeah. Well, what occurs to me is that what you guys are doing is the definition of leadership, which is to say you're going first to make it easier for other people to follow their own, you know, best angels. Yes. Right. When you do it, like you're doing the hard thing, you're you're breaking down the wall. And it's implicitly giving permission for other people. So that, you know, that I can see that change really cascading over time in the same way that your advocacy for for a healthy lifestyle um, has also you know, it hasn't gone mainstream in your community or in, in my or in anybody's community. And yet we can see changes in terms of mm -hmm. acceptance Absolutely. of a plant based diet from now, from 10 years ago. And so I, I really want to, you know, I, first of all, thank you guys for spending so much time in the truck. Uh, I love it. Talk, talking about this. And and second for I mean, the journey you guys have been on and the depth of it and the depth of your commitment. I really want to to honor that and say how how moved I am and how proud I am to be in your in, within your circle of influence as you guys have, uh, you know, I'm sort of, you know, Jewish white liberal from the Northeast. And there's a great deal of, of um, self satisfaction that can come from that. And you guys have challenged me 
in a way, it's easier for me to stay racist than for you to stay racist. And your guys' example have really challenged and inspired me to do better every day, too. So I really want to honor you and send you guys a lot of love. Thank you so much, Howie. Thanks, and I, of course, we're not going to gush over each other for the whole last minute or two. But I just I really appreciate your friendship. And, it, you know, it means a lot. You've taught me a lot, too. And um, I'm just forever grateful. That's all. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This was one of the longer episodes we've done. And I think Shocker. I think uh, I mean, there's two of you. It's uh, yeah. on, on average, it's normal. And we're both long winded. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it so much. All right, you guys have a have a good weekend. Be safe and talk to you again soon, I hope. All right, brother. Thanks, Peace, man. All right. So I really would love to hear your thoughts about this episode. Uh, you can do it if you want to go to the Wild West of YouTube um, and leave some comments there. Um, that would be awesome. And you can find a link to the YouTube. You can find the YouTube video, which you can click through to the YouTube website at plantyourself.com slash 415, where that's where the show notes are, where you also see links to everything we talked about, all the books, all the videos, all the documentaries, the resources, all the media that Dustin and Josh consumed on their journey of transformation from racist to anti-racist. So this episode has been long enough. I'm going to skip the usual stuff, running news, garden news. Thanks, uh, except to thank everyone, of course, for for listening, for supporting the show, for when you uh, argue, arguing uh, respectfully and with an interest in the truth rather than winning. And big thanks to everyone who is doing the work, who's doing the internal work of looking at ourselves and seeing where we're falling short, where we have blind spots, where we are causing harm through unconscious and unintentional behaviors, and having the courage to step up and changing ourselves and to have some uncomfortable interactions with people so that we can turn to our grandchildren when they ask us, what were you doing? And we can give them answers with, with integrity, answers with pride, and answers that can model for them, the kind of courage that they'll need um, to continue this this human experiment of making the world a fair, loving, beautiful place for for all beings. So thanks again for listening, for watching. And as always, be well, my friends. All right, time for thanks. Thanks to Will Reidenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace. You can find more of Will's music at his website, willreidenauer.com. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Maurer, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Mr. Cobb, Rachel Behrens, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jennifer Polkinoski, David Bizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Landry, Josina, Sarah Durkis, Rhymes with Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Janet Selby, Janet Selby, Janet Selby, hi Janet, Claire Adams, Tom Franzak, Jeanette Benham, Gil Lassert, David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Dorona Vizov, Gio and Carl Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesen, Ruth Ann Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, The Equally Mysterious, Tracy Z, Aviva La L, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lineman, Rhymes with Cinnamon, Nick Harper, Martha Bergner, Susan Ahmad, Nolly Levine, The Inscrutable Harry R, Susan Laverty, The Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Kelly Machia, Dean Norton, Bonnie Lynch, at Plant Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Cobble, Julian Rodkins, Breed O'Connell. Shannon Hirschman, Linda Ayat, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinwa, Connie Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Olakoski of Plant Power for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Karen Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Ann Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazleton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justin Divich, Ashra Summermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan Bacorny, Stephen Lehman, Patty DiMartino, Mike and Donna Cartz, Dean Bishop, Bill Briel, Gunter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Kelly Molden, Trish Adams, Ian Kramer, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bayshore, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gullich, Laura Heaton, Meg from Mama Says, Rochelle Kennedy, Diana Goldman, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, Holly Butler, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parham Ganshi, Amy Daly, Brian Tourville, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, Josie Dempsey, Karen Schmidt, Pamela Hayden, Emily Perryman, Olga Sidoraska, Allison Corbett, Richard Stone, Lauren Vaught of Edible Musings, Aaron Hasty, Sean Owen, Sagar Nayak, Erica Piedra, Danielle Roberts, and Michael Lushton for your generous support of the podcast. 
That's it for now. As always, be well, my friends. <laughs>